Hey everybody, welcome to another interview on the AI Guide. And today I'm very happy and honored to have Frank Kane with us. Frank has his own company, Sundog Education, and Frank has also worked previously with Amazon and IMDb. Full disclosure, I use IMDb every single week, probably. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and I noticed, among other things, that you have 17 issued patents, which is wild, in distributed computing, data mining, and machine learning. So would you please give us a brief introduction and tell us a little bit about your courses? Sure, yeah. Uh, so thanks for having me on. Uh, again, my name is uh, Frank Kane, and kind of my main thing these days is uh, doing online education in the fields of big data, machine learning, data analytics, uh, web services, stuff like that. Been doing it since uh, 2015, and we can talk more about how that all happened later. But um, yeah, these days I have, gosh, 600,000 students around the world that have actually taken my courses. So it's pretty mind blowing to think about that many people. <laughs> that is, that's a lot of folks. And you say all over the world, literally from all over the world? Literally, uh, I think the only countries that I don't have students in are like Antarctica and places like that. So it's wow. a pretty, pretty wide reach. Congrats, that's great. Um, how did you first get interested in AI and data science? Yeah, I, I just kind of stumbled into it, you know, and I think uh, that's probably like a lot of people's career story, right? You kind of just uh, go with what opportunities come your way. And if you say yes to the right things, you get lucky sometimes. Um, in my case, I was actually doing a, a video game development. It was my first career. I worked for Sierra Online back in the day and places like that. Um, and one day I got a call out of the blue from Amazon in Seattle. They said, hey, you want to interview for this job we have in our personalization department? And I had never done anything with the internet before, you know, um, an e-commerce or anything like that. And like, why are you calling me? But I guess they saw something in my resume that uh, was unexpected. So I went out there, I did the interview and uh, actually got hired. And the first thing they did was put me in what they called at the time personalization. These days we would call it recommender systems and machine learning, but this is back in 2003, so it was all brand new back then, you know? Yeah. Um, but it was super fun, right? So um, I was kind of hooked. I'm like, hey, you know, we can actually build algorithms that can really understand people and understand what they want and what we can give to them to sort of fuel their nerdy little interests. So uh, that was kind of the original motivation of what we were trying to do back then. Yeah. And then you carried that on when you were at IMDb? Yeah. Uh, you know, at IMDb, I was more of an... Uh, at uh, the senior manager level. So I was running the entire engineering team. So it wasn't mm -hmm. just machine learning. It was building their mobile app and all that other stuff too. But obviously IMDb has an interesting movie recommender and uh, movie recommendations are still near and dear to my heart. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of my favorite pastimes when I have free time. Um, how, so you said you started your education business in 2017. What made you decide to leave the corporate world and start your own thing. Yeah, that's another case of just kind of following the opportunities as they come up. So um, I didn't actually leave Amazon to do education. Uh, that was more of a personal thing. We just couldn't take the weather in Seattle anymore, quite honestly. So, gotcha. you know, <laughs> we saved enough to like, you know, be able to try self-employment for a while and move to Florida where, there, where there's more sun and whatnot. Uh, so at first I was just doing contract work, you know, doing some programming stuff on the side and kind of paying the bills that way. But uh, one day, this is probably 2014, I guess, um, I got uh, an old colleague of mine from Amazon was working for a company in New York around where you are um, called General Assembly, and they needed someone to help develop curricula for a, a data science course that they were developing. So I said, sure, I'll do that. I, I can do that. And that kind of led to Udemy giving me a call a few months later saying, hey, we need someone to teach um, Hadoop and big data and data analytics on Udemy. Are you up for it? And like, why not? Why have to lose? Um, and fortunately, that just, uh, fortunately, that snowballed, you know, like I put out one course and it did okay, put out another course that did even better. And over time, it just kind of like exponentially ramped up to the point where, like I said, there's uh, over half a million people around the world who have learned machine learning and data mining from me. So that's, uh, it's been a ride. <laughs> wow, that's wild. So what is the typical background of your students? Would you say it might be all over the place, but in terms of experience and education, what do you see generally? Well, I'm sure, you know, there's no like uh, prerequisites that are enforced on these online learning platforms. So anybody can try to take them, but uh, I think the ones that are successful 
at least have a background in linear algebra. So you at least need, you know, that level of mathematical background to understand what's going on. And you at least need to have some experience in programming or scripting, right? Preferably Python, but um, if you can pick up one language, you can probably pick up Python. Okay. Uh, anything else you see that sort of stands out with the folks that are attracted to your educational resources? Um, they they want do they want to go out on their own maybe to yeah. do work or what do you see with that? You know, I think there's just something inherent to somebody who seeks out education online to begin with, right? You know, these are people that are going outside the traditional channels to learn stuff. They're not, mm -hmm. you know, paying a jillion dollars to go to a university and have this stuff shoved down their throat. They're actively seeking this knowledge. So um, that's definitely another huge piece of success there, right? If you're self-motivated, you're curious, um, and you have the perseverance to stick with this stuff and learn it and try it and just experiment with it until you understand it. Um, that's what really makes a successful technologist in the real world. Okay, great. And how long is one of your typical courses in weeks? Well, there's no set time frame that you have to take them in. So they're all, you know, take it to your, at your own pace. Uh, in general, they're around 10 hours of video content. And there's typically, you know, several hours of hands-on activities in there as well. So, you know, however many hours you can free up in the time you have is how long it takes. Uh, typically, you know, I'd say one or two weeks is what it takes for people to get through it, but it's all at your own pace. Okay, great. Yeah, that's really, I'm really happy to hear that because as I mentioned to you before we got started, I'm trying to give my audience resources that they can do outside of work without having to go back to school to learn yeah. some of these skills so that they have better career choices. And I know you support that. Um, what challenges are you tackling with regard to your company right now? Do you, are you in development with a new course or is there another specific challenge that you're working on right now? Oh, there's always a challenge. <laughs> so the biggest challenge is just keeping everything up to date, right? Because this field is moving so quickly. Um, yeah. the algorithms, you know, that's not so hard to keep up with. They, they change a little bit more slowly, but the, uh, implementations like the actual web services out there are changing their UIs and their APIs and their offerings all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so lately I've been spending a lot of time updating my courses to reflect the latest offerings from Amazon Web Services on uh, SageMaker, SageMaker Canvas, all the new stuff they're coming out with there. So that's been a lot of work. And we're also working on a new course about ML ops. So the actual science of operationalizing and productionizing um, all these algorithms and actually doing something practical with it in the real world and making sure that it remains adaptable to changing conditions in the real world. So uh, that's our current focus right now. Yeah, that's really interesting because I read an article recently that said there's a real shortage of people both for ML ops and in terms of infrastructure management, like mm -hmm. helping run Amazon Web Services and stuff like that. Absolutely. They're very hot areas and uh, there's not a whole lot of resources out there right now for people to learn it. So I hope to fix that. Super. Um, what most excites you about the potential of AI? You've been in the field for a little while now. So what really excites you about it? Oh, man. I mean, the, the potential is huge, right? Um, I would love for my Tesla to actually self-drive at some point, you know, yeah. reliably. <laughs> Um, but, you know, there's all sorts of beneficial applications, you know, specifically in the medical industry, you know, diagnostic stuff, um, sort of assisting doctors and making their decisions in a more unbiased way, hopefully, if you're, well, bias in AI is a whole other topic, but if you do it right, it can be a good thing. Um, and I'm also like really excited about um, where GPT-3 is heading and beyond. Um, you know, it's, it's both scary and exciting at the same time, right? Uh, but they recently had OpenAI open up GPT-3, where if you pay them a few bucks, you can play with it yourself. And I haven't had a chance to do it myself yet, but a friend of mine has. And the stuff he's getting out of it is just mind-blowing. I mean, it's complete nonsense most of the time, but it sounds realistic, you know? <laughs> it really feels like you're talking to another human being who really knows what they're talking about, except they don't. But um, right now, it's a pretty interesting tool for sparking the imagination, right? So as an example, um, he was asking some questions about the formation of the universe. and you know, where did antimatter come from and things like that. And he got these entirely plausible sounding results back from it. That would make a great science fiction story. But when you look it up, it's complete nonsense. But <laughs> it's just, uh, 
it's amazing how creative it can be, you know, and I find that exciting that uh, creativity is something we can build. Yeah, I think one of the reasons I started the AI Guide was because uh, after I started going to AI conferences out in the Bay Area and stuff, um, and I've been in systems not like you, but differently for 20 years now, um, I realized that the impact of AI was going to be very broad, and it was basically going to hit almost everything industry-wise that's happening today over time. And so, uh, but your your comment you started out with was great too about self-driving because I just did a video on how that's really taking much longer than they expected because the challenges are big uh, with the chaos of the street environment, people walking into the street, cars, running red lights, all of that stuff. It's a difficult task to master. Uh, yeah. what, what do you think is a realistic timeline to solve that issue, if you had to take a guess? My uh, lead engineer when I was at Amazon, I actually had lunch with him a couple of years ago, and actually we have a standing bet on when self-driving cars can really run autonomously on the streets in the wild. Uh, my bet was five years from now, and I'm not even sure it'll be by then. He thought it would be already done, but I won that. Yeah. One. <laughs> <laughs> but it's kind of weird, you know, like it's kind of like where computer graphics were 10 years ago. Like we were in the uncanny valley where, you know, it wasn't quite good enough. Um, and that's kind of where AI seems to be stuck at right now. You know, it's almost as good as a human, but it's just not there yet. And uh, getting over the, that last mile is just proving really, really difficult. Yeah. Maybe is it a factor of, data aggregation and there being enough data for the algorithms to really work flawlessly or is it more algorithm driven or both? I think it's both. I mean, there's certainly no shortage of data fueling this, right? I mean, Tesla's been collecting data from all of its cars for, you know, probably close to a decade now, right? So how much yeah. more data could you possibly want? Um, it has all the data in the world it could possibly need. Uh, and yet, <laughs> you know, it still confuses a shadow of an overpass for an obstacle in front of my car. So mm -hmm. um, there, there's more to it than data for sure. There is just some um, learned knowledge that humans pick up in the real world throughout the course of a lifetime that is just hard to replicate. And um, that's, that's going to continue to be the case. Yeah, and computer vision, even though it's advanced very, very rapidly recently, uh, maybe it's not quite to the point that it needs to be from the example you just gave. Yeah, it happens all the time, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you have any concerns about AI and how it's used both now or in the future? Yeah, my concern is that people are going to think that it's better than it is and sort of turn over decisions that are still best left to humans to AI prematurely, right? So... Um, that's one concern. Um, there are also concerns about bias that I touched on earlier. You know, any any training data that we give to an AI, is, it's only going to be as good as the data you give it. And if there's bias baked into that data, your AI will be biased as well. And a lot of people think that because it's an AI, it's some sort of, uh, you know, superhuman thing that has no human bias, but it can learn that bias just as well as we can, right? So um, I think that's been talked to death though already. So I think a lot of the practitioners are already very cognizant of these ethical concerns and doing their best to avoid them. Uh, my biggest worry though is, you know, people who are just so excited about the technology, it's kind of like uh, in Jurassic Park where Malcolm, whatever it was, it's like, you know, just because we could do it doesn't mean we should do it. Um, there's people out there developing like AI powered armed drones for the air force and stuff like that. So AI powered weapons terrify me. Um, yeah. Granted, humans with weapons terrify me too. <laughs> They're not much better. Um, but, you know, the, the danger really there is that we're turning over too much to the AIs prematurely. Like right now, they can sort of guide us, give us a second opinion, maybe uh, double check what we're doing. And as long as it's within that context, great. You know, that, that's good. Uh, but turning over the controls too soon, uh, letting my car drive itself too soon, that's bad stuff. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, do you have any advice for new students in computer science or young adults who are entering their career? And if, if they would like to 
take your courses, uh, what kind of advice would you give them, either students or after college? Yeah, stay curious, you know, um, you know, approach it from a standpoint of uh, wanting to learn new stuff and uh, learning exciting new capabilities. Uh, this is really a fascinating field and the idea of sort of building your own brain. I mean, how cool is that? Not only do you learn about how to build these systems, which are highly marketable, uh, you learn more about how yourself works too, at some level, you know, just kind of working backwards there. Um, so yeah, to kind of like maintain that curiosity that you had when you were a kid, when you approached this stuff, and that will keep it exciting and keep it fresh and keep you motivated. Because it's really tough to get bogged down in all the notation and academia stuff. But at the end of the day, you're, you're building fun stuff. And if you just keep it fun and keep yourself curious, that's what will motivate you to become great at it and become, you know, more and more valuable to the world. Yeah, that's great advice. And thank you for giving that. Um, so tell my viewers how you can, how they can follow you and how they can get to your courses, please. Oh, well, if you look for Sundog Education, we're on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, all that good stuff. Probably the best thing, though, is to go to sundog-education.com, and we have a mailing list there you can sign up for. So if you want to stay in touch, uh, that's the way that I send out most of my information. So sundog-education.com. Great. Or whatever. Yep. <laughs> Great. And uh, this question just popped into my mind. Do you think this type of education is in broader terms, the future of education, do you think formal education will change into a more on-demand and specialized uh, acquisition of knowledge? It seems to be settling into sort of a hybrid uh, approach, really. So, um, you know, before the past two years of madness, we kind of had traditional education on one side and on-demand learning on the other, and they were two totally different worlds, right? So they've kind of merged a little bit. Uh, where we have, you know, video-based training on, on more formal channels. But what we're seeing on the uh, on-demand side, you know, the Udemy's and whatnot of the world is more of a demand for what we call cohort-based learning. So a lot of people want to have classmates. They want to have a community around them that are learning together with them that they can draw on. And I think that just draws to different personality types, right? Like some people just want to go read a book and be done with it. Some people just want to go experiment on their own and, and be done with it. But a lot of people kind of need that social support to learn new, new big things. Um, mm. So this whole uh, cohort-based learning, they call it, where you have sort of this little tight community of people that are learning along with you on a fixed schedule. Um, so it's not really on demand. You're, you're kind of following this group along as they go through the course. Uh, that seems to be a, an emerging um, popular mode of learning. Great. Well, thank you so much. Congratulations on the success that you've had with Sundog Education and uh, your new course and trying to keep up, as you said, with how quickly yes. everything changes. And thanks for joining us today. I really appreciate that. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it.